Hello and welcome everybody to the CoTESL International Conference and, and this session entitled English Language Ideology Reproduction and Revision by Native Speaking Teachers in South Korean Classrooms. All right, I'm going to hand over to our presenter, Anita Greenfield. Anita, take it away. All right, thank you. Hello and welcome everyone. Thank you for attending. Um, I'm going to share my screen with you so you can see some things. Um, ooh, let's hope. Let's hope this works. So I apologize for that taking a little, little bit of time here. And let me. Okay. All right. So today I'm going to be talking to you um, about Anglo English language ideology reproduction and revision by native speaking teachers. And that's just meaning like who the Korean government has classified as native. Um, so I'm not making any claims there um, in South Korean classrooms. So my research question for this project was how do these nest or the native English speaking teachers, I'm gonna shorten it a bit, um, construct the value and character of global English in which ideologies are reproduced or revised in this proce process. So the research setting is South Korea. Um, South Korea has a very long history with English um, and a, a pretty long history with hiring native English speaking teachers as well. Um, they came first in like the, the late 60s with the Peace Corps, and um, people have continued to hire them in different classrooms, um, usually, usually be by like country specific standards. So, and there's been a long history of this, so it makes a good place to um, look at these types of issues. So I'm going to start and talk a little bit about what has already been done um, in looking at English language ideologies in South Korea. So there's been a fair amount of work on this subject. Um, maybe one of the most famous being Park's study in 2009, where he looked at the, the Korean society in general and found three different um, English language ideologies here in South Korea. The first being necessitation, this idea that Koreans, every Korean needs English. It's a necessary skill for Koreans. Um, the second is externalization. Um, and this one I'll be talking quite a bit about. Um, and this is the idea that English is a foreign language in Korea. Um, it's not like it's very it's, it's kind of outside of the society. It's foreign, it's external. And the last is self-deprecation. And this is the idea that Koreans cannot learn English well. Um, so there's those three ideologies that he found within the society. Um, other authors have looked at other different way, other ideologies in South Korea. One is a connection um, with neoliberal ideologies and this idea of English being indicative of success. If I learn English, that's a step to success in the business world, in the capitalist society. Um, others have kind of looked at this idea of externalization as well and said, well, that's true, but also we need to look at what English means within the Korean society. And they have shown that this, um, that ideology, it gets tied up with social class and social standing here. Um, so that's another ideology that's been looked at. And then finally, others have looked at this idea of native speakerism as an ideology here, and particularly Americanism, since uh, Korea has had such a long history of connection with the US that that is really the dialect that's preferred here. So these, this is kind of what's been done in terms of English language ideology. These have been looked at in various different settings or through various different groups. So people have looked at this in the media, um, in school policies as well, and particularly within school policies that relate to the hiring of native teachers. Um, they've looked at students' reactions and interactions with these ideologies. Um, also with parents who of students who are learning English. And there's been one study looking at specifically at Korean teachers and their interactions um, as well. And if you notice, there's missing here anything with um, teachers come from 
outside of Korea. So that hasn't really been looked at despite that they're quite a big part of the society. What has been done looking at these teachers is mostly the ideologies they represent. So the studies will focus on policies for hiring them um, and how like those ideologies are kind of like they're representative of those ideologies, but not really how they interact with them too much. There's one study that looks at ideologies they present um, or a little bit of uh, research done by someone called Elizabeth Root. She did her dissertation on this, um, talking a little bit about that interaction, but overall, this is an area that's really missing in our understanding of what's happening with English ideology in Korea. Um, so, and this is kind of a problem because we, uh, Korea has hired a lot of native English speaking teachers and it hasn't really looked at their agency, or no one has really looked at their agency and what they're doing um, beyond, like beyond teaching English, what other things are they also presenting and rep uh, representing in their classrooms. So that is where my research question comes in. Um, how, do nest re, uh, um, how do nests construct the value and character of global English and which ideologies are reproduced or revised in this process? I've looked at this in three separate areas. So the first is what kind or whose English is represented. And this is kind of the interaction between these teachers and ideas of native speakerism and Americanism. The next thing I've looked at was with what location is English associated? So this deals with the ideology of externalization mostly and somewhat with necessitation, but where is English external to Korea or is it a part of Korean society? Um, and the last would be how is English um, being taught? So this again, will look a little bit at externalization um, and also a bit at necessitation and a few other issues. So the data is coming from a larger project um, that started with interviews um, of just like a more, this was a ge more general to get an idea of what was happening with a variety of native English speaking teachers as well as some Korean uh, English teachers in 2015. Focus groups were done with um, native English speaking teachers uh, in universities. And then in 2019, I also did some classroom observations to see how all of these issues played out within classrooms um, in universities. And I also interviewed um, the university uh, teachers, the students, and gave this all the students a survey as well. So the data was transcribed and coded in Q minor. Um, like kind of following the grounded theory of um, letting the letting the codes come from the data rather than imposing codes on the data. Um, those codes then allowed me to look at certain categories of data and then do a closer analysis uh, discourse and analytic, analytic approach to that. So I'd like to start with looking at what kind of English is presented. So these are the interactions between with um, Americanism and native speakerism. So um, some of the teachers here presented the idea that English is American and not surprisingly, these were Americans usually, most of them, not all of them. So this one was maybe the strongest example, but others would bring up um, examples of having to speak American English uh, as well. But here, um, these are all pseudonyms. So George said, you're a, so he's talking about the best possible teacher. So what is, what is a good teacher here? And he says, I think a bilingual teacher could have an advantage. If you're Korean American and you speak Korean fluently and English fluently, and you have a perfect American English pronunciation in English. So he's making, the qualification that in order to have this position, if you're bilingual, you also have to have this perfect American English pronunciation. Um, so that the type of English here, that is the correct one is American English. And in other places, he says similar things about the students. 
Other teachers have said um, other similar things. So that's coming from, and then also in the classrooms, you'd see specific like Americanisms being taught. Like, well, in America, we say things this way. Um, so this idea that American English is kind of the correct English being taught here. When it gets really interesting is when um, someone who is not American actually picks up this ideology and reproduces it in the classroom. So Deidre um, is Irish and was working in a Hagwan. And she says, so I guess they want American accents. They're not getting them. They're paying us less money. And, the, and then she also tries to uh, bring about like using an American accent within her classroom. So she says, I wouldn't speak with this accent. I use Americanisms. I speak American English. Um, and she goes on to even tell a story how she hears the kids sometimes speaking with an Irish accent. And she says, no, no, they can't do that. That's, that's bad. So she's kind of internalized this ideology of American English is the correct English here. Now, this wasn't all the teachers. Um, this is the case of a teacher, an elementary school teacher in, from New Zealand. Um, and although she also kind of picks up some of this with changing the way she speaks, um, using the ah chant instead of chant, like the, the, the more New Zealand pronunciation. Um, so she uses these, but then she also says that she kind of tries to work around this ideology by mentioning things in her class, like we say it in New Zealand this way. Or she said she shows this picture of her mom and she spells it M-U-M very intentionally because she's my mom, like in New Zealand um, and not, and that's the word she uses. So she does this in kind of ways that she can, ways in which she can get away with it, um, kind of in what, what I would say is like a liminal space where the authorities have less control as a sides, but in some ways she's still pushing back against this ideology a little bit. So we see some of that. The other thing that I wanna talk about in terms of whose English is taught is that throughout all of the data, um, no one was accepting of Konglish as an acceptable form of English. Um, anytime Konglish, like which Korean English um, was mentioned, it was mentioned as a weakness or something to be kind of gotten rid of. So this is, this is another way of supporting externalization of English and saying that the local forms are not right. We need to have other forms. So here, um, Konglish is listed as a weakness and a common problem um, in Koreans' use of English. So along with grammar problems, functional use, Konglish is this um, in Carl's and then other people have said similar things. This even showed up in some of the classes. This is an excerpt from a college class um, where this teacher, Sam, is saying they were talking about music genres the students listed ballad as a genre, which is something that in Korea, um, I've asked several Koreans to, you know, like, what is your favorite genre of music? A lot of, and, and several of them have told me ballad. So it seems to be a very, like, ballad is a genre um, in Korea. But here, the teacher corrects it um, and specifically labels it as Konglish after correcting it and saying that this is not the way you should speak. So this is both like kind of supports a native speaker type a model and also externalizes English by rejecting these forms. Next, I'm going to look a little bit at where English is located. So dealing specifically with um, externalization and also with um, this linking of English with social class and standing. So first, I'm going to look at a couple models that I found for English as internal and how people reacted to this. So the idea of tying English with social standing is something that pr pays particular attention to the local way of using English. So a lot of the teachers mentioned this, and here Stephanie says the same, English ability and stuff is tied up, I think, with the social economic class. 
So a lot of the teachers were recognizing this um, English being a symbol of social status or social economic class. However, everyone in all of the data generally wanted dis recognize this, but disapproved. So um, this idea of English being a way, I call it an elevator because it's a way of raising your social status. Um, this was generally rejected by all the teachers. So in favor, like, so basically saying this, this way that it's used internally in the country is not a good way of doing things. The next model that was more internal, I'm calling the idea of English as a web. It's a way of connecting the world, but it's still very local. So that it's um, here, like the key thing here, it's everywhere. It's part of Koreans daily life. So it is internal. And it's not just like before with the elevator, it's not just this thing that we use to get, to take tests or to do so, to, to raise social position. It is actually a part of people's lives and it connects them with others around the world. Um, so it's hard to escape English. He lists different functions like watching movies, um, playing internet games, cell phone games. Um, there's a lot of things that people are doing in English. So this kind of, um, and further on, he talks a little bit about how um, Koreans are taking control of English as well. So internalized, but also internalized and taking ownership. The next two models I'll look at are English as external. Um, in a lot of interviews and in classrooms, English was frequently associated with travel. So it's the it's part of the means of leaving Korea, but it's also part of it's it's used outside of Korea. So I asked all the teachers, like, how how much do you think your students will use English in the future? when they said they will, most of them mentioned things like, like Daniel, they're gonna use it for travel in a travel situation. They're gonna use it to study overseas. So this idea of travel and abroad gets kind of connected with English. So it's not an intern, it's never an internal use, it's an external use. Um, this showed up a bit in the classrooms as well. So Ted was teaching, um, large numbers in English. So things like above 10,000, you know, above 10,000. And the justification for learning this was travel, right? You're gonna travel, maybe you'll go to Vietnam. Here's how you're going to use this. And it's again, external to Korea. There weren't a lot of justifications for learning English in classrooms that were internal. Next one was not a popular ideology. This is the um, linguistic imperialism, but this is a definitely a way that English can be externalized uh, because it looks, it's an outward force coming in, right? It's imperialistic and colonizing um, and it's outward coming in. That one was not, not so popular. Uh, the last thing I, the last question I want to look at is how English is taught. And this again will deal a little bit with externalization as well as some other issues. So along with teaching English, a lot of the teachers connected English with teaching culture or opening Korea up to the world. So it was kind of like a cultural mission. So this was an, a response, and there were several other responses like this, of what is your goal for your students in your class? And Jerry says, well, in the first place, I'd like them to be more international in their outlook, not being afraid to go to a foreign country. So it's not just English, but English becomes this kind of like opening up worldviews. And again, kind of externalizing. The next thing of the way English was taught um, is I'm calling it it's neutralization. Um, and it's kind of an act of erasure. So erasing some things that were there. So several of the teachers 
would try to say that English is like any other subject um, or that English is the same, or they, they compare their learning of another language with English, which in some ways is fair, right? They're both languages. So here, Patrick says, I can, he talks about his learning Korean and using it in public. And he said, here in Korea, adults who are too ashamed, they're too ashamed to speak like a kid in a foreign language. And he says, I completely understand that because I'm going through the same thing. Um, so there is that, but in some ways this is kind of erasing that necessitation ideology, the, the idea that Koreans need English. So generally people who are English speakers um, don't have that ideology of necessitation when learning another language, um, particularly here in Korea. In this case, if you're learning Korean, that it's not tied up with social class. It's not tied up with necessitation. So by making equating that, which several teachers did, it kind of erases all of that internal functioning of English, the necessitation, the social class, um, the like necessary, like the necessity of English to get a job. So in some ways it neutralizes what English is and means um, by ignoring some of the other ideologies. So through this study, I've seen that um, native teachers here are interacting with some of these ideologies, either upholding them or rejecting them um, entirely or kind of um, reshaping them a bit, kind of like what Jane did in dealing with the American and native speakerism. So some of the things that we've seen them interacting with are Americanism, native speakerism, necessitation, externalization, and then this idea of neutralization. Um, there, so their selection and rejection of certain models. Um, but these are all, were all done in kind of a moment by moment way. They would orient to different ideologies at one point and then to others at another point. So it was a complex system of interaction. So these modify, mod models that I've shown you are simplified um, coming from complex interactions. But this is just a start to see kind of what teachers here are doing. Um, so there are some limitations and things for um, yeah, future Nisa, We've run yep. out of time. Perfect. OK. <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh, I'm sorry. Yeah, we, have, we have to make room for the next session, okay. which is going to start very soon. Uh, but thank you very much for that really interesting presentation. And I'm quite sure there are people with questions. So I have shared the Discord link in the chat. If you're not on the Discord server yet, please pop over there now, and then you can continue this discussion with, with Anita on that platform. All right, I'm terribly sorry for cutting it short. No, that's okay. <laughs> all right, thank you very much all. And thank you very much, Anita. That was actually really very interesting. I wish we had more time because I've got some questions myself. Okay. <laughs> well. Uh, well, thank you very much. Thank you for hosting. Yeah, thank you. All right. Oh. Enjoy the rest of the conference all. See you soon. Thank you.